It's sports. All around the clock. Sports all the time. That's the concept of the news. Oh, that's never going to work. <laughs> that's ridiculous. I mean, that's like, that's like a 24-hour cooking network or an all-music channel. <laughs> ridiculous. That's really dumb. Seriously, this thing is going to be a financial and cultural disaster. Sports Center. Think about that. That's just dumb. Hi, I'm Lee Leonard, welcoming you to Bristol, Connecticut. The San Francisco 49ers prove once again why they have the best record in the NFL. For the first time ever, it's the NFL on ESPN. Send it in, Jerome! California has just suffered its most severe earthquake. The Gretzky! This is Ben. One score and five years ago, it all began here, what we now call Building One. Back then in 1979, it was about a third of the size of what you see today. And all of ESPN fit inside of it comfortably. Now, 2004, with building after building, and as you can see, dish after dish, and dare we say, ESPN network after network, we can comfortably just shake our heads. Did this all really happen? 25 years? Really? Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Berman, and welcome to our Silver Anniversary Special. There's no other way to put it. We already said it. What a long, strange trip it's been. Back on September 7, 1979, when ESPN sent its signal up to a satellite, I swear it had to be Telstar or maybe Sputnik, and then that signal came back down, we were on the air for the very first time. Although, where were we on the air? After all, in 1979, who had cable TV? Who knew what cable TV was? And a station devoted to 24 hours of sports? Who possibly watched that? Well, those questions seem preposterous today. But 25 years ago, they were very real. And ESPN seemed downright surreal. As time moved on from 1979 into the 80s, we started to obtain a cult following. We were your little secret, tailor-made for you, the sports fan. As we expanded towards what we hoped was a bit of pop culture ourselves, we apparently became a darling of it. I never complain. Every night at 11 o'clock, we watch Sports Center, and I never say anything. Hey, you want to go upstairs and watch Sports Center? Great. Still might make it home in time for Sports Center. Hey, welcome to Sports Center. I'm Stuart Scott, and alongside me is newcomer to the program, Chet Harper. Hey, hey, how you doing, Stuart? <laughs> All right. Hey, Chet's more excited than Dennis Rodman at a Clinique sale. <laughs> 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 Booyah! Got your partner. <laughs> Did we put on the news? I think it might be raining. <laughs> oh, just hold on a sec. I'm watching this rugby thing on ESPN. Did you ever watch um, ESPN Classics? Oh my God, I love ESPN Classics. Something about it, you know, it's so, it's so soothing. When talking about the century's greatest boxers, the names of Joe Lewis, Rocky Marciano, and Muhammad Ali come to mind. But true boxing fans may also recall a less celebrated heavyweight who dominated his sport from 1912 to 1914. He's James the Gentleman Masher Corcoran. Has anybody ever seen this thing on ESPN, these poker games? The eighth annual World Series of Dice. Some of the greatest players from around the world have gathered here to compete for the grand prize. One another's money and bragging rights for the whole year. I'm kind of psychic. I have a bit sense. What do you mean? It's like I have ESPN or something. Y'all been coming up here for years trying to steal our routines, and we just love seeing them on ESPN. So there's no TV in this room? TV in bar. Ask them if they have ESPN. So she's got in the lounge band to actually play Here Comes the Bride when we walk back in. I love that song. And all the football guys are in the lobby watching. There's even an ESPN crew. Jonathan Traeger, prominent television producer for ESPN, died last night from complications of losing his soulmate. I'm gonna tell you what the problem is. The problem is you don't know your role. Know your role. And what's your role, huh? Watching ESPN and then holding your shit all day? He's the next phenom. He's awesome, baby, with a count delay. The guy's unbelievable. So 
if the Bears beat Detroit and Denver beats Atlanta in the American Southwestern Division, East Northern, then Milwaukee goes to the Denslow Cup, unless Baltimore can upset Buffalo. There's a lot of pain and shame in those eyes. Friends, it's all over. Wow, that is a disturbing image. Difficult to watch, Chris. <sighs> Dan Marino passing to Hoodie and the Blowfish. It's a fumble! They do not go all the way! ESPN is a gathering place for sports fans from everywhere and fans of everything. Now, we thought in this two-hour journey down memory lane, we'd ask you to vote for your favorite games. Now, you could have gone the NFL or Major League Baseball or some of our myriad of college basketball tilts, but you could have picked Essendon against Fitzroy in Australian Rules football or our first live game ever. Do you remember what it was? Men's professional slow-pitch softball. Doubleheader. The Kentucky Bourbons against the Milwaukee Schlitz. <laughs> Brought to you by Budweiser. True. We ended up with our top 25 games. Let's get started. Game one, Western Conference semifinals between the Ducks and Stars. Fifth overtime. LeClaire in by Hatcher. Centered by Archot. Score. There it is. In sudden death overtime. Down by 30 in the second half against East Carolina in the GMAC Bowl, Marshall rally. Six-point game, 16 seconds left. Quick corner to the end zone, it is... Oh, my God! He caught it! steps up and broke, and it is caught! And Marshall wins! <laughs> Dolphins trail the Jets 17-16 with 12 seconds left when Pete Stojanovic, having missed a game-tying extra point earlier, thought redemption. 37 yards, officially. And Dolphins win it. Australian Open quarterfinals. Andy Roddick and Younes Elenawi played the longest fifth set in Grand Slam history. Two hours, 23 minutes. Oh, my word. Just when you think you've seen it all. An honor and a privilege for this classic, historic quarterfinal. First round NCAA East Regional. 16th seed Princeton was on the brink of upsetting number one Georgetown. Mark Tillman, the runner, goes down. We're tied at 47. Princeton the ball, down one. Mueller fires. No, the Hoyas escape. Much more to come in our Silver Anniversary Special. I'll have a special guest join me next as we explore the defining moments of ESPN. Later, you'll get a look at your favorite ESPN anchors before they were household faces. Scary. We'll see some of those anchors at less than their best in our ESPN bloopers and blunders journey. We'll see how the name ESPN literally became the identity of some families. We'll go behind the scenes of This Is Sports Center ad campaign. And we'll highlight the greatest plays in ESPN's history, as well as continue our greatest ESPN games countdown. That and much, much more. Welcome back, everybody, to our Silver Anniversary Special, and it is my pleasure to welcome a, a very dear friend. John Saunders came to us back in 1986. Oh. Welcome back. We've covered just about everything together and uh, did the sports centers for a long time. 43 collective years of being here at ESPN, although I wonder why we didn't do more shows out here. First of all, I didn't know you are that old. <laughs> Second of all, you're Canadian, so of course uh, you, you don't mind doing a show out here in December, January. It looks pretty good, eh? No, we love it. Now. We did the first sports center that was regularly an hour. And once upon a time, yeah. all the shows were a half hour. And Sunday night, one hour uh, was the thing. And we, we kind of had some fun during that. Well, Jim Schoenfeld we? said to Don Koharski, the referee, one night, have another donut. I think a reference into his girth. And so we brought a dozen donuts onto the set. And one you night. explain what having another donut was. And then Bob Dylan, right down the road uh -huh. here at Lake Compounds, was playing on a Sunday night. Sorry we couldn't go to the show. <laughs> but we brought the show to Sports Center because we quoted every Dylan song possible Everyone at that time. It. Now, is it look over my shoulder? Isn't that McDonald's? Do you think we can tell them? I think the statute of limitations on McDonald's stories has passed. <laughs> I think we can tell them. Well, there was a Sunday night show with a um, 
a 10-minute Sunday night conversation. And we decided, with the help of a getaway car, yep. to uh, throw to the tape. And while the live show was on the air, we drove off, zipped through the drive through They handed us the bag, a couple of Big Macs. Mm -hmm. Then what? We got back, took a bite. One bite. Set it napkin, down. Napkin. And then talked about what a great piece of tape that had been, even though we saw none of it. Don't think that would work today. No, I don't think so. I don't know that that was a defining moment of ESPN, but through 25 years, we've certainly seen fire and we've seen rain. Defining moments? Yes, there were many in ESPN history. We hatched this crazy idea that we would do sports around the clock, but there was still something missing, and we hit upon the idea of doing a half hour sports news show. We thought that that would be a defining moment if we could say, look, sports fans, you can watch the headlines with the big three guys, or you can watch sports with us. Six months after the first sports center launched the network, ESPN began televising weekday NCAA tournament games in March of 1980, airing contests that were previously unavailable nationwide. You'll be seeing a total of five games tonight on ESPN, and eight more tomorrow night. It's going to be a bonanza of college basketball. All of a sudden, I started to hear people talking about, hey, I saw the game last night. What game did you see last night? I saw the NCAA early round game. The fact remains, I think it put ESPN on the map. Nobody really had a national sense of what was going on. ESPN helped expose basketball on the East Coast to those in the West, and it became more important. In 1987, ESPN ventured out of the sporting mainstream and down under for the America's Cup, live from Australia. The reward was record late night ratings as it became the first cable network to reach 40 million homes. The innovation for TV was phenomenal with the America's Cup. Not only do we have pictures from the air, but pictures on board. And then as important as picture was, was sound coming off the boat. That was one of the first events that I think ESPN clearly branded themselves as being superior to any other coverage. ESPN did a fabulous job of personalizing it and being able to broadcast it in a way that made it very compelling television. Also in 1987, just seven years after it started televising the NFL draft, ESPN introduced the league's new Sunday night package. Good evening, everybody. I'm Mike Patrick, and it's great to have you with us for the NFL on ESPN for the very first time. In the past, ESPN was known for a lot of periphery sports. ESPN presents the World Frisbee Championships. Once they got the NFL in 1987, they were taken most seriously as a bona fide network. It also opened the door for us to get Major League Baseball. Once we got that to go with our hockey programming, we can start things like ESPN2. Baseball gave ESPN programming during the week and in the summer when there's a drought. Plus baseball, which has a, a kind of a different demographic than football, drew in some of the older fans. In 1989, with the banishment from baseball of Pete Rose and the World Series earthquake in San Francisco, ESPN demonstrated its journalistic capabilities. Pete Rose and baseball, not together anymore. I think the defining moment of our news acumen was the Pete Rose being banned from baseball. We were cutting from Cooperstown to Philadelphia to Cincinnati to New York, and we put together a story that told the entire story. Bob Lee live outside Candlestick Park, where according to reports locally, Northern California has just suffered its most severe earthquake since 1906. The first critical several hours, I mean, we were the only live pictures out of that area. The earthquake happened just several months after Pete Rose. The confluence of those two events showed people that this network was here to, to treat serious stories in a serious way. Of all the games and all the shows, one has remained the network's signature program. And since 1995, it's been the subject of an irreverent offbeat advertising campaign entitled, This is SportsCenter. The best tax rate is the lowest possible tax rate for the greatest number of people. So those short shorts, they would give you a wedgie. It was successful because it juxtaposed surprising things with a spirit of fun and occasionally with a little twist. 
$4.62, Mr. Sampras. It showed ESPN's clout that uh, ESPN can get all these people to come and participate in something like that. But when they do, it's not in any sort of chest pounding, we're number one kind of way. It's really, I think, propelled ESPN and Sports Center to a whole nother level. Whether it was, again, the acquisition of the NFL or the baseball rights or televising the America's Cup or college basketball, people look at building blocks to where they started and where you end up. When ESPN started, and for a good number of years after that, it, it had a charming scrappiness that comes out of being an entrepreneurial venture. Now it's an empire. Now it's less charming and it's not scrappy anymore. It is, in many ways, the most powerful force in sports. And we remember them all. In 87, when we got the NFL, that the Chicago-Miami game, every engineer we had on mm -hmm. staff was there to make sure that every plug was in. I couldn't even get into the studio. It was such an exciting moment for all of us. And you were part of our NFL presentation the first few years. Yeah, I was on primetime, but not actually in the same room with you. Second year, I actually got in the same room, different set. Third year, I actually made it next to you. Good things come to those who wait, my friend. I know you're thinking college hoop, though, here. When I came here, I was immediately put on college basketball and immediately paired with a guy by the name of Dick Vitale, who really defines what this network is all about. He was called in 1979 after he got fired from the Detroit Pistons, and he had no idea what ESPN was. He had no idea who was calling him. He just knew he had a job and was happy to have just that. And being paired with with him, you got to see the enthusiasm he had for the sport. I remember in 1989 when Princeton almost knocked off Georgetown. He and I on the set together looking at each other in amazement and not saying one word as we came back. But again, this network would not be yep. what it is without Dick Vitale. Enthusiasm. He, oh, could light up, he could light up the city of Bristol just by Absolutely. his enthusiasm. And about. Well, good to see you. Welcome you too, home. Man. Well, just to make you feel at home. Uh -huh. Your brethren from Canada, Bachman Turner oh, yes. Overdrive. You ain't seen no, 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 nothing yet. <laughs> Still to come, did you ever wonder what your favorite ESPN anchors looked like before they made it big? There's some scary sights. Then, later, we're not always perfect. We know it. ESPN bloopers and an inside look at the now famous This Is Sports Center ad campaign. And hear from some of the athletes that helped make it so. That's all coming up. Town called Bristol, way, way back in history. ESPN, that's the present, it's a family tree. Chris Berman, Dan Patrick, Stuart Scott, and Dickie V. Lee Corsa, Linda Cohen, Kenny Main, and Bobby Lee. ESPN, the season of the fans get live. Bill Rafferty, Mike and Mike, ESPN 25. ESPN, the Total Sports Network. ESPN, the worldwide leader. ESPN, the silver anniversary. ESPN, the greatest moments in sports. Represent, get not stop him. You can only hope to contain him. Hi, and welcome to Sports Center. Hit me. Are you serious? And the Lord said you got to rise up. Hey, yo, the Sports Network be the greats. Yeah. Pardon the interruption, it's prime time and instant classic taking place. Yeah. Every generation, all sports, fans can get a taste. Minus the majors, X Games, smashing through the gates. We blazing. The greatest players and the biggest names. Amazing. 24 7 sports, the games. Yeah. This 25 years to celebrate and start the countdown like NFL. Season of the fans. I'm out now. We have contact. He's awesome, baby, with a capital N. Not so fast, my friend. Kung Pao. He's a PT Peter, a primetime performer. A developing situation. ESPN, the Total Sports Network. ESPN, the worldwide leader. ESPN, the silver anniversary. ESPN, the greatest moments in sports. What a long 
strange trip this has been. Welcome back to our silver anniversary special. I get asked by college kids all the time, what did you guys do before there was ESPN? How did you get your sports? But we had our ways. A much more scary question would be, what did you guys do before you were on ESPN? Scary because <laughs> there's evidence of how we looked. I wanted to burn a lot of these tapes, but was overruled. Here we are, BB, before Bristol. But after seeing this, you may look at the way you earn your daily bread in a different light. It's a Hollywood formula that's bound to spill success despite all of the rubble and debris. The unexpected has happened this year in Miami. The name's been changed to Wally World. I describe my pre-ESPN experience as a joke. Canadian Opium, open, wait a second, not Canadian Opium champion. It was a six-point lead early in the second quarter. <laughs> that was something on a biasteros. I had like David Letterman gap in my teeth. So I had these plastic braces, these adult braces, and it looked like I was still in high school. Not Van Heflin, his name is, I can't remember what his name is. How many more years do you think you're gonna be in baseball? For an eight-year-old sitting there talking to Pete Rose, nothing could be better, it was like paradise. Did he 35 more hits last week? 34. 34? 34. 34. What I don't know is whether that sign says Talladega or Talladega. I still remember the professor said, what do you want to do with your life? I said, I want to be a sportscaster. His reaction was, oh, come on, you're going to waste your career. What are you doing? I couldn't get a job in TV, so I worked in radio. My career started with running religious tapes on Sunday morning. Sunday showdown against Kenny Wood in the East Hampton Bonnickers. My first job was uh, Taco Bell. I had already experienced Burger King while in college. The first Saturday in May also means I cannot continue my <laughs> As the folks would say in California, it's killer. I think I wanted to be a fireman, then I wanted to be the Fonz, and then pretty much right after that, I wanted to be Chris Berman. Matter of time, Hall of Famer, the minute he stepped on the uh, baseball diamond. Exactly right. All right, I'm glad you agree. I do too. You got paid $23 a show now. But I'd still come in at, at noon to physically push the buttons on the tape because if I didn't do it, nobody did. So it's about two dollars an hour to be on TV in Hartford. Seattle lays 16 hits in their 13 to 5 win over the Red Sox. Let's go right to the highlights. It's Cy Young time. The American League will name theirs tomorrow. I had a bad 70s look only in the late 1980s. This is what King Crunch will be riding on tonight. The thing that sticks out to me as I look back at my old tapes was that. I look like the third member of Wham. For the last time, you are watching my large head on a Channel 12 close-up. <laughs> uh, in the studio, though, it is much hotter than that, over 90 degrees. I'm really a jeans and t-shirt kind of guy. I don't enjoy dressing up. They only lost by 30 the other night to guess who? Hamilton College! It's the same rich bunch of yuppie preppy guys who scored over 1,600 on their SATs. Two hot teams met Thursday night at Madison Square Garden. I went to Cornell and you have your roommates going to medical school, and the guy down the hall is going to law school, and this guy's going to Wall Street, and I'm going to Binghamton, New York for six bucks an hour. I don't know what the hell was in the water in Binghamton. Here, only two months, Jarvis has no prior coaching experience. Me and Bill Pito used to live together, and Trey Wingo worked at a different station. That wraps it up in sports. A tremendous, a huge, a behemoth <laughs> trade. And I remember when Bill got the job to go to Syracuse to be the weekend guy. We were like, dude, excellent. You're going to a real station. That's great. So I go into Handy Mart for shaving equipment, and the man at the counter says the hydroplane equipment is breaking down. I quit that Seattle job in 1989 and called this guy that I used to work for. I used to be garbage man. And he said, you can assemble garbage cans. I was like, I'm going to still work at ESPN. So what if I'm assembling garbage cans right now? I'm just going to figure out a way to get there. The red zone is really the hottest new term in all of football. I don't think you'll find anybody in this business who didn't leave some sort of nomadic life. The news hurt me more than most. You can't make it very long on 12 grand a year in Butte, Montana. He's so run the first 10 runs in the fifth to climb the Oakland A's 12. Huh. Whoa. Makes you wonder what ESPN was thinking about when they looked at our resume reels. You like that plaid coat I had? Still have it, actually. It doesn't fit. I use it as a washcloth. <laughs> Still to come. We've had some memorable action on ESPN over the last 25 years, but we'll zero in on the greatest plays ever produced on the network. And still ahead, the madcap, embarrassing, captivating moments as we enjoy our favorite bloopers on ESPN. 
And we take you behind the scenes of the This Is Sports Center ad campaign. We'll also continue our countdown of the 25 greatest games in ESPN's history as voted by you, the fans. Stay with us. Twenty-five years of ESPN, then twenty-five years of great games, and we're counting down the top twenty-five. But how do you count how many plays we've seen in twenty-five years of games? You can't. You don't need the actual number anyway. You just need your noggin to remember some of the brilliance we've witnessed on our airwaves since 1979. Wasn't it Shakespeare who once said, the play is the thing? Maybe he was talking about ESPN. Here are our greatest. Whoa. That is awesome. Casey Powell behind the back. The box. There it is. All right, Ozzie. And there's the jump ball. Oh, he went in. Raphael Forcal, an unassisted triple play. And it's blocked again. Oh, how did Prince get there? Down the side by first down and more. throw was never even made. No, the pitcher had the ball the entire time. Stepped off the back of the man, <laughs> faked the throw. And there are eight seconds to go. Ames against Paxson. Five seconds. Inside. Eight scores. It is all over. Kustak to the end zone for the win. God! Northwestern wins it! Allen with Iverson on it. Throws one up. It goes! It's back there, long leaps. He makes the catch and saves the game. Still a chance for the Huskies. He did it. Way back there. Gone. A grand slam over. Stanford wins. They touch coming down through the trioval at the line. Who wins it? Wow. Dale Jarrett, a photo finish. Brias pointed at the woods beyond the left field fence. Frias has a cold shot to deliver the tying run. Alford wants the shot, leans into it. Got it. Oh, Steve Alford, is he clutch? McNair throwing the other way for the tight end, but Mitch can I don't believe it. Under five seconds. Jackson lost the handle. Got it back. Got the shot away, and he hit a three. Game's over. Moving blue line chance. Oh! Long. Oh, that's hit well to center field. Finley goes back. Back, back. It's over. Todd Kirk, the Mets have won it in 10. You and him. He still has to spell it. Oh. Like, went well, right through the strings. Look at that. Yeah. People are getting crunched. Oh, that's a door. <laughs> Magnus Danielson of Sweden is this year's world's strongest man. He is focused. This man has eaten 17.7 pounds of calf brain. Why? That's the fastest calf tied in the history of rodeo. And you have... We have lost our minds. Yeah, how about that one? Get it right there. Never give up. Never give up. Tuition, and I'll throw in the books, baby. Oh, oh, oh. One million dollar shootout. Neil Nelson. Oh! He won! He hit it! Back to back on run. Not to be outdone, says Junior. Flipper Anderson has just set an NFL record. 336 yards. Let me look up. Let me look Field. A no-hitter for Dave Stewart. And 
Joe Valenzuela joining Dave Stewart. Back to back no hitters on ESPN. There's one. It's a no Coming up, the NFL, NBA, NHL, Major League Baseball. It wasn't always the big boys on ESPN. Randy and Jason Sklar dig up some classic ESPN material they'd like to see back on the air. And still ahead, the wild and wacky from ESPN's 25 years certainly brought a share of memorable or forgettable moments, depending on how you look at it. That plus your favorites from the This Is Sports Center ad campaign. Stay with us. Greatest plays, greatest games. We've got them all in our vaults. But then there are the forgotten treasures, the forbidden fruit, if you will. We've got plenty of that as well. You may know the Sklar twins, Randy and Jason, from Cheap Seats on ESPN Classic. What you didn't know was that they spend their spare time in the nooks and crannies of the ESPN archives. It's a different view of our history. Many will agree that today ESPN is truly the worldwide leader in sports. However, looking back at its 25-year history, we feel that ESPN, in its quest for global sports domination, has lost touch with its roots. Sure, they've gotten better. They've updated the bottom line to look like this. School officials believe Huggins has done some soul searching for the better and made good on his court-required responsibilities. It used to be this. Uh, they haven't lost since the, we've turned into 1982. So who is number one? I'm not sure we have the answer. I'm we feel like if they would just revisit a few sports that they used to cover, ESPN could become the solar system. Nay, the entire galaxy's leader in sports. Here are some of the events we'd like to see back on the ESPN schedule. Hello, everybody. I'm Chris Berman, and welcome Darts. to the second... Remember the days when a young Schwamm covered this ballroom favorite? We do. It was the only time in any sport that we've had difficulty determining whether they were covering the men's or the women's bracket. Which brings us to model airplanes. We miss the days when model airplane racing was shown on ESPN. With that music, they're trying so hard to make it like Top Gun. It's not even Naked Gun. Goose, you've got a mig on your tail! Oh, God! And whoever said that bringing stuff in and weighing it isn't a sport has never seen the rattlesnake roundup on ESPN. The oldest. Just to be clear, these guys take rattlesnakes, throw them in a trash can, and they're considered athletes. Hell yeah, that's a sport. Is he entering the competition or just doing his recycling? Should he really be wearing sunglasses while he's doing this? Yeah, I mean, he's indoors, and extracting poisonous venom from a rattlesnake seems like a precision activity to me. Fine, you want a more traditional sport? Let's go to racquetball. In 1982, ESPN did. Racquetball, Electric Avenue style. Boy! Welcome to the sports I know it's only racquetball, but come on, put on a tie. Or at least button the one second from the top, Tom Jones. Okay, here we go. It's good to know that the crowd reaction is genuine. Uh, the pony yeah, smell my pits and I'm all right. Wait, oh, nope, need some right guard. If his shorts were any shorter, they'd be a belt. And we can't talk about early ESPN without talking about one of its staples, Australian rules football. Part soccer, part football, part rugby, part gang fight. This sport popularized the bumblebee sock. Show me the most boring guy in Australia. Good evening. I'm Peter Vandy. Now give him the blandest background in TV history. Perfect. This makes Charlie Rose's set look busy. This is the kind of game that you make up with your friends while you wait for your parents to pick you up at the bus stop. Wait, the guy's down? He's injured and they're still playing. Yeah, they'll just, you know, play around him. But aren't they in danger of getting the too many trainers on the field penalty? And here's how they dispute a call down under. Headbutt. Easy there, Rodman. He's going to get tossed. That's thinking of the team first. 
Now, in today's landscape, as far as ESPN is concerned, the digital revolution will be televised in HD. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to Sports Center with Scott Van Pelt. I'm Steve Levy. But can we honestly say that today's Sports Center is more cutting edge? than this. Hello again and welcome back to the ESPN Sports Center. Jimmy Myers here with this look at what's happening. Jack Donlin member. Around the bag, blunders, gaffes, bloopers, whatever you want to call them. We have the best of them from ESPN's 25 years. Plus, the ad campaign that makes you laugh and put Sports Center, for that matter, ESPN, in a new place in pop culture. Now, back to our, or should I say, your countdown of our top games. Here are numbers 20 through 16. John McEnroe against Max Bielander, Davis Cup quarterfinals. Fifth set, 79th game, matches in its seventh hour. McEnroe does it again. And McEnroe, after six hours and 45 minutes, looks as though he is in tears. Third overtime, game six, Stanley Cup finals. The Stars needed one more win over the Sabres. It's loose! Fourth overtime, Game 7, Patrick Division semifinals between the Islanders and Capitals. It was, at the time, the longest televised NHL game in history. Turn around, LaFontaine, score! Pat LaFontaine, 3-2, Islanders! With under nine minutes left, North Carolina trailed Virginia by 16. Enter Michael Jordan. There's a steal, takes it away from Carlisle. Bam! Carlisle for three, long. Rebound, Michael Jordan. North Carolina has come from behind and won it. Third period, game seven, NHL Eastern Conference Finals. The Rangers led the Devils one zip. Issue was settled in a second overtime. Welcome back, everyone. Our cornerstone program from the very beginning has been Sports Center, morning, afternoon, and night, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We're closing in on our 30,000th show. More than Emmett Smith has yards, or Pete Rose had at bats, or Kareem Abdul Jabbar had rebounds. It's been a gas putting them all together, and it's also been a real gas being able to promote our pride and joy. Our This is Sports Center campaigns haven't just pushed the envelope, they've opened up their own post office. So Carl started drinking a little bit, and then he was going on and on about he and Mrs. Met. I mean, nasty stuff. Seriously, man, what's your real name? It's Trey Wingo. <laughs> we gotta cut back. We gotta let you go. I'm sorry. That's not gonna work. I don't want lotion. Get away. 98. The This Is Sports Center campaign actually began with a Widening Kennedy advertising agency team going to Bristol, Connecticut. In 94, we actually spent about five days up there. And it was cool because we would sit in on a show and we would meet the anchors and we would talk to them. The premise of This Is Sports Center from the guys that created it was what if, in fact, Bristol was the center of the sports universe? Yeah! 
Thanks, Drew. No problem. Oh, yeah. I think the ads are funny, particularly because they are self-deprecating. Uh, Keith, how's he faring? Very satisfactory, Dan. What's up? Aren't I supposed to be asleep? Dan, you're in my way. I can't see what I'm doing. Yeah. Well, that'll happen. It was tough to shoot the film because Keith was laughing, Dan was laughing, I was I was laughing. I had like one line and I could barely get it out because those guys were being so funny. Dude, it's cool. It's cool. Robert Lee, the generals. Just want to say hi. Welcome. Bob, here's how it's going to go down. I want these two twins on a fitness show and maybe wipe out one of the Saturday morning prepaid things. Where's the caterer anyway? The what? The caterer. Food? Yeah. Four months ago, I was writing a paper about my idol, Craig Kilborn. You've embarrassed me on national TV. Gary? Uh, Glenn? OK. Here I am getting career advice from him. Two words for you. Pizza delivery. I think it made us more than just talking hairdos. So I think people looked at you and said, OK, got a personality, sense of humor, a willingness to laugh at himself. Getting the opportunity to be in Jerry Maguire, that was a real thrill. Show me the money! Show me the money. You complete me. Who's coming with me? Who's coming with me? You had me at hello. You had me at hello. I'm Charlie Steiner. I'm Charlie Steiner. I'm Charlie Steiner. I am Charlie Steiner. Charlie Steiner was the, the darling of these commercial people. Hi, Sydney. I'm Bobby. I'm the new pool boy. Want to rub some cocoa oil on my back? Charlie always got the punchlines. Y2K test in three, two, one. Follow me. Follow me to freedom. We had to beg athletes to come in. I remember begging Grant Hill to come in to play the piano. Hey, Dan. What's wrong? Hey, Grant. Uh, bad show. Hair looked bad. Teleprompter went down. When I was asked to do my ESPN commercial, it was kind of a new concept. You know, I, I had never heard of it. I got something to show you. Thanks. Thanks, Grant. Appreciate that. No problem, man. I got invited afterwards to a lot of piano recitals. People would come up and give me a dollar, tipping me like Dan Patrick did. I got approached after I won the PGA, and they said, how'd you like to do a sports center commercial? literally said yes i don't care what it is when it is you are somebody in the sports world when you've made an espn commercial rich beam beat tiger woods in the pga championship by a shot but more people are asking him about the ad thanks for the ride beamer anytime scott see you today we are gonna read the rumble in the jungle book you get a chance in a way to make something funny that not necessarily be funny so charlie says you're maybe the 50th best heavyweight in the world in Georgia walking through an airport and this kid five or six hey Steiner come get your whooping Charlie come on out and get your whooping Charlie come on out come on out and get your whooping <laughs> Charlie got a reason to be hiding the reality is just because you're a former athlete doesn't qualify you to be a sports center anchor. After the Olympic gold medal, the Rhodes Scholarship, 10 years with the New York Knicks, I was a U.S. Senator for 18 years. Any experience in front of an audience? Well, I gave a keynote address at the Democratic National Convention. Uh, I meant a large audience. Oh, I did one sports center commercial being interviewed uh, for a job, and I'd go through airports, and people would shout at me, saying, you know, did you get the job? Did you get the job? You know, we, we've drafted kids right out of high school. We had this one kid who would not believe the scouting reports. Emotionally, though, he just wasn't prepared. Jimmy Key is attempting Jimmy to come Key. back. Jimmy Key, what's he like, 45? I could hit him. Jack, did you watch, did you watch the game? I mean, they suck. Lance, what's the story? Hey, hey Dan, sorry. Thought everybody left for the night. Can I get you an energy bar? How about some water? No, and I'm okay. When you talk to people about ESPN, you get as many discussions on the advertising and our commercials as you do on anything else we do. It's a real credit to how the advertising has helped define the company. Oh, okay. His name. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tiger. Go, uh, Stu. You want to sponsor me in the Bristol Road Race? No.
This is Sports Center. This is Charlie Steiner, our compatriot for 14 years. Welcome home, buddy. It is good to be back. Nice Thank to you. see you. A voice now on the radio of the New York Yankees. And at least uh, you got a tan shooting that pool ad, Charlie. When we went out and shot the Bobby the Pool Boy Melrose Play spot, going out to the West Coast and seeing all these wonderfully beautiful, attractive mm. starlets from Melrose Place, one after another, and they mm. had no idea who the hell I was. <laughs> the guys wanted to come over and talk about the Angels and the Dodgers and the NBA and the NFL and whatever. And that's always the case. The beautiful women's wanted nothing. To, wow. It was art imitating life. Right. And by the way, did anybody ever follow you to freedom? I'm still waiting for my first. You want to come yeah, aboard? Well, you should. You know what? I, I'm thinking back to that, that 60s show. Do you remember how we, we ended that thing? I think I'm having a flashback. Charlie, I got one bit of professional advice for you. Plastics. And I have two words for you. Far out. I'm hip, man. Wow. Nice hair, huh? Well, at least... At least you still have some. Well, sorry, both of my strands are in place. Uh, you know what, peace, brother. You just get a Woodstock and you can say that. Anyone that says they remember the 60s really didn't live through them, did they? Now, look, all these things are planned gaffes, if you will. But then there are others, as you know we like to say here at ESPN, or I do. Hey, it's on its way to Pluto. Don't worry about it. And you know what? Take a look at these. Some of them should have been. Where are they? We are on? We really are. Oh, well, hi. And good evening. Welcome to Sports Center, along with Bob Lee, I'm Dan Patrick, Ray Knight. I'm Peter Gavins. Yeah, I'm right. <laughs> I'm Stuart. Oh, sh sh I'm not Stuart Scott. <laughs> Welcome to ESPN's Tuesday Night Baseball. <laughs> oh, boy. He loves hockey. <laughs> With NCAA sanctions expected to come down this week, the University of Miami. I'm sorry, folks. We're losing it. There will be four eight-team <laughs> John McEnroe said Kornikova looked out of shape. Good luck. <laughs> and he was being nice. <laughs> My favorite blooper. <laughs> All of them involved Charlie Steiner. That's a shock. As part of the prenuptial agreement, Tanya gets to keep the pickup truck. Michael keeps the tool chest. Says Michael Smith, quote, <laughs> I don't like... <laughs> he gets the tool chest. You have just seen the star witness and plaintiff in a $25 million civil suit. <laughs> Wood was in a Scottsdale, Arizona courtroom paying a $90 fine after pleading, oh boy, after pleading guilty to public urination, Mish Blood Green and went shopping for a suit or some other <laughs> piece of haberdashery. Oh no! <laughs> The perpetrator is alleged to have told the policeman, I can't stop now, I have to finish. <laughs> Will the fighters use mouth guards or put their teeth in a glass at night before they go to bed? It is the first time in recent memory that Gary Wood made a relief appearance. <laughs> <laughs> Your turn. Ladies and gentlemen, our national anthem. When Carl Lewis is singing the national anthem. Oh, say can you see and the rockets red uh-oh and you know because you know charlie the glasses the beard the really fatherly type and the whole bit always in control the great voice and he just is absolutely losing it uh, <laughs> Tears are coming down my eyes, boogers are flying out of my nose, spit's coming out of my mouth. <laughs> written, by Francis, <laughs> written by Francis Scott off key. Over here. Hello. <laughs> That's the situation in the NL West when Sunday's play began. The Dodgers and Giants deadlocked. I'm heading south. Scores! <laughs> We've had a power problem here in beautiful downtown Bristol, Connecticut, but you are still hearing us through the magic of satellite. Fans booed Canseco's two performances and even pounded on the truck he was in when he left the park last night. Can we give you the mic? Thanks. <laughs> 
Yes, this is television where you need a microphone, that is for sure. Okay, so there you see uh, Dave Revson walking right behind me. Andy, what's your take on this? You agree with Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, this is a veteran team, and they take a great deal of satisfaction in this. Well, they do take a lot of satisfaction. The same team that had a 49% interest sold also had a major trade rescinded. All right, so that the latest word from Jack Donlin. What about the word from NFL Commissioner Pete Rozell? He dumped a paper bag containing stocks and bonds worth a million dollars. The set is jumping. We'll see you next week. No fracture but a sprain to Joe Montana's middle left foot. Now, of course, not his middle left foot, but the mid portion of his <laughs> left foot. That would be difficult, wouldn't it? Well, once Bordick touched third base, that now took away his option to go back and retouch himself. <laughs> it is my claim to fame. I think you have to be known for something. Hurst has been playing with a bulging dick disc in his neck. Once every couple of months, uh, someone will still come up to me and say, hey, you're the bulging disc guy. Yeah, Ismael Valdez has been throwing the ball all year long well for the Dodgers. He's been throwing uh, his, uh, his percentage of uh, ERA coming into the game. Um, uh. And I think Michigan's going to have a monster year. They got a commitment from Juwan Howard and a kid by the name of Jimmy. I'm telling you, this kid can play. Understandably, here in the Laker, a lot of luck. Jose can... Jose can... Uh, Tell him I can hear. Tell him I can hear this. Ah. Oh. <laughs> no. Bino was so lovable and wonderful that no one will ever have him like him. We seem to be inching. Oh, f this game will be played. Oh, f no other sport can catch it. Oh, f Why do I come down here? I can hear him. Tell him. But the college presidents and the college I what? Oh, f they can fire me. I can't do it. But I think the one thing that's interesting about the USFL people, George is... Watch it! <laughs> In Mobile, Alabama, for Sports Center, Lou Palmer, ESPN. Runs on your mark. Get set. You've got to be kidding me. Together, Ramos... The key to success in the offensive huddle is concentration, and it's over a very short... <laughs> Together, Ramos and Haydock sparked the U.S. offense in the second half against Germany. <laughs> now for Keith Millard, he's almost home again as training camp nears an end. Boom! Oh, for this one, sir! He's going to have you for dinner. As Syracuse comes from behind at the end to beat Georgetown. That's a wrap. And the news. <laughs> um, you've been supplanted by Bino, pal. You know, Bino had a good run, but unfortunately, or fortunately as the case may be, I messed up more than most. No. Carl Lewis, Charlie. I mean, let's face it. It was so Awful. Yeah, oh, God. And once we were on the air, and it was like sitting in the back of the class with a substitute teacher, and you're trying to hold it in and hold it in, and finally she comes back, and you've lost it, and it's never coming back. <laughs> and here it is, I don't know, it's 12, 13 years later. People, to this day, I hear about Carl Lewis once or twice a week. He was worse than Roseanne Barr. It was the all time worst. All time worst. <laughs> Glad you're there to see it. <laughs> well, welcome back to share that all-time worst with us, right? Oh, you Thanks. leave the bloopers to us, huh, Charlie? <laughs> when we come back, we've had more than a few fans of ESPN, but some families have gone to extreme lengths to show their devotion to us. Can you imagine naming your child Aspen? But first, here are our top games, numbers 15 through 11. Fourth quarter, eight seconds left. Indianapolis was down three to Denver. From 54 yards to tie. Got a chance. He's got it. Vanderjack to win it in overtime from 51. He's got it. He's got it. The Dolphins led the Broncos by two with 50 seconds left in regulation. This will be from 55. 
five yards. It's good. The Dolphins trail by one with 11 seconds left. This is 53 yards. Trailing Virginia by five with one play left, FSU's 29-game ACC winning streak was in jeopardy. Here's the ball game. Touchdown! No! They say he didn't make it. Virginia's upset Florida State. Early in the second half, Kentucky was 31 points behind at LSU. Here they come! Comeback miracle in Baton Rouge. Arkansas and Mississippi set the record for the longest Division I game in history. This is the first ever six overtime game. Wow, what an incredible game. Seven OT periods at least. Throwing with it and got it. Arkansas wins. Okay, so what does ESPN stand for? Entertainment and Sports Programming Network. The entertainment part was added because SPN was already taken back then by a Spanish-speaking network. <laughs> no hablo. So the E was added, and here we are. A four-letter word. At least to some, we've been named as sort of an accomplice in divorce cases. But a much more delightful set of stories is that our name has become the given names of babies across America. About 20, as a matter of fact. When we were in our infancy, trust me, we never imagined infants being named Espen. I am ESPN. I am ESPN. I'm ESPN. I am ESPN. I am ESPN. We are the kids named Espen. We tried family names baby books, everything, and the names that she liked, uh, I didn't care for. The names that I liked, she didn't care for. And my sister was here, and she jokingly said, you know, you watch so much ESPN, you should name him Espen. I thought they were crazy. You know, I asked Kathy, have you picked out a name yet? She said, ESPN. Yeah, right. Espen was born at 2310, at weight 811, came out just screaming. People thought we were joking, I guess. Some of them think it's a cool name because it's different, but some of them think we're just crazy. We were watching the Super Bowl in 2001, and this commercial came on. I'm a regular sports fanatic, and that's why I read Espen, the magazine. And I looked at my husband, and I said, Espen is a cool name. At first, I thought she was joking. She saw this, and it really, I guess, stuck with her. I was on the USS Wyoming. We were out to sea, and they said that the captain wanted to see me. And I said, hey, we got a message in saying that uh, your wife, uh, Christy, had delivered a baby boy. She's fine. The baby's fine. But I got to apologize to you for the name. We didn't get the name right. It says ESPN. And uh, I told him it was Espen. And he asked if it was a family name. And I said, uh, no, sir, not a family name. You don't watch much sports, do you? Before we had children, you know, you dream about names for your kids. They were like, oh, you know, when we have kids, I want to name her this or name them that. And he said, Espen. And I said, you're joking. And he said, no, Espen. I said, where in the world did that come from? And he said, ESPN. That's what you watch on TV. You don't have a kid named Espen. A lot of people think we're saying Aspen, but it's not Aspen, it's Espen. And we get that, oh, OK, <laughs> y'all are weird. I thought they were just. You know, it'd be a joke and they'd get over it, but they didn't. Becky wanted to go ahead and go with ESPN. Just follow it if you're going to name a kid that. The teacher it. in me said there needed to be another vowel in there. Then she came up with the Y, E-S-P-Y-N. Most 
unusual name that we had besides that, where we were a minister, we had a baby in the community named Jim Beam. I think Espen sounds a little bit better to me. I was watching Sports Center, thinking of some baby names for our first child, and came up with Espen after sounding off the letter of ESPN. And I said, okay, we can have this name Espen, but you have to find it in a baby book. So he went searching through, he said, a dozen baby books. Finally able to find Espen in a baby book. It was a Danish name, it meant God bear. I needed the E there just because I didn't want it to be too over the top. So we decided to go with Espen. I believe it was in Michigan. A couple was going to name their child ESPN after ESPN, of course. And then I was like, well, if we're going to do it, let's just do ESPN, ESPN. But it took a lot of convincing. I remember opening up my chart, and I knocked on the door, looked at his name, and it said ESPN. I had no idea how to say the name. So I walk in there, and there was Rebecca with ESPN. I try my hardest not to say his first name. I'm waiting for mom to say it. When we named him Matt, we thought for sure he would be the only child spelled ESPN. Espen, the worldwide leader in names. <laughs> you kindergarten teachers across America, here they come. And speaking of names, we haven't even discussed Dave 06010 Bristol or the late Nino ESPN Oza. I guess we've used a few throughout the years. I look at it as reviving a lost art, a trip back to yesteryear when so many athletes, especially baseball players, all had nicknames. When we return, the saga of nicknames here at ESPN and how they inadvertently fought the law and the law didn't win. And later, can you guess the only team to make the playoffs for all 25 years of ESPN's existence? We'll have that answer. Stay with us. Charles Moscow on the Hudson delivers. John, tonight, let it be Lowenstein sends it to center field. Way back. God, tonight, let it be Lowenstein. Yeah, yeah. Hey, yo, Gabby Chef, feel a dream. John, tonight, let it be Lowenstein. Billy Lama B. Sit call for your brain. Gone, welcome home, Mattingly. Me and Willie McGee. Frank Tanana Daiquiri. Jose Lino me. White, good and plenty. Craig Shipley's, believe it or not. Chuck Chip off the old non block. Mike Great Scott. Ron say hey. Jimmy Alfred Hitchcock. Candyman Maldonado. Oh, Jose, can you see Kaseko? Back, 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 back. It's gone. Mark Amazing Grace, Barry, you was born. Nate Tron means business. Danny Airy Canal, Andre Bad Moon Rising, Bill Base Motel. He could go all the way. Touchdown! ESPN, worldwide leader in sports. The Swami, Chris Berman, nicknames of all sorts. What? The Swami put to rap. Who'd have thunk it possible 25 years ago? Our thanks to our man Remedy with that song. Some names I hadn't thought of for a long time. The list goes on and on, and dare we say, way back, back, back in the annals of sports. I can tell you that it was an accident that 1,500 nicknames later became a staple. But they were once banned in Bristol. Here's the evolution of the nicknames. The beauty of what went on in 1979 at ESPN was it was a work in progress. And the one thing that, that we tried to to impress upon everybody was be yourself. Chris took that to the ultimate level, especially with the nicknames. Mid-June, 1980, one night, he just all of a sudden came out with it. John Mayberry's up, and here's Mayberry RFD, and everybody in the control room just started laughing. It really took off then. Dan, the man from Gladden, was one of my favorites. I remember the first time hearing it, I was cracking up, you know, and I'd get in his ear and go, who? One thing that Ed Farmer told me with the White Sox is not only is the obvious, Fisk and Eschen handling the guys like Rich 280Z Dotson. At one point he said, Dennis Upper Deckersley, and that's not real flattering, you know what I'm saying? We all had nicknames. He was the guy that tapped me with Toe Tap and Timmy B, the tapster. But as far as the ones that jumped out at me, you know, look, um, you don't get much better than uh, Burt B. Home by 11. I still run into a lot of people that, uh, hey, Burt B. Home by 11, how are you? 
What it meant to me was being a pitcher, I wanted my team home by 11 anyway, so it worked in perfect. John, I am not a crook. The first time I heard it was on SportsCenter, and, and, and I heard him say it, I'm like, what, what did he just say? I did not know that that was a Richard Nixon saying. Well, I'm not a crook. Mark, Eve of Destruction, McGuire. I don't know if I was born when they came out with that song. That was probably really good at that time. And if they had to do it again, I think he'd come up with a better one. The players really got a kick out of it. You knew you arrived if he had a nickname for you, and you didn't have to be a great player. It was a case of role reversal. The athletes came out and sought out Boomer. They'd come to him and say, oh, I love that nickname, or that one's got to go, or, or what about this one? I used to leave Bristol once a week to go on the road and do boxing, and I used to come back to Bristol and tell the management that the one name that the public kept bringing up on the road was, what's Chris Berman really like? And the management didn't think he was exceptional, and I kept saying, you're wrong. Everybody on the road wants to know about Chris. In 1985, Jack Gallivan was brought in as executive producer. Here comes this guy in who's, you know, basically going to shake things up. The nicknames struck not just Jack, but others as not being as professional as they wanted to be. I just don't think you should poke fun at anyone's names. I think it's degrading. Jack Gallivan went to Chris and said, uh, I don't want you to do nicknames. He was crushed by it, and I said, look, just hang in there. I remember Chris saying, OK, if you don't want me to do nicknames anymore, do I call Sparky Anderson George? And that was his retort to his boss at, at ESPN that if I can't use nicknames, then I'll start calling Whitey Herzog. OK, and here comes the manager, Doral Herzog. <laughs> Nobody was a bigger fan of Boomer and his nicknames than George Brett. And uh, at the beginning of the 1985 playoffs, after this whole thing happened, George Brett got wind of it and was absolutely incensed. We knew that there would be reporters there. And George said to me, he says, well, hey, how can we get this thing changed? I said, well, why don't you come up to me during the pregame warm-ups and start ranting and raving? I said, no, you tell him if you can the nicknames, I ain't watching the show anymore. Uh, that's part of the show. What he did was perfect timing. And George kind of ignited that public opinion. Suddenly, as if magically, back in spring training, the nicknames were back, as they should be, and all was right with the world. Oh, to be young again, McDowell. And look at the play by Gary Little Lady from this art senior. Andres, the giant Galarraga, le grand shot. Bob McDonald served it up. Look where he is now. Boomer has become one of those larger-than-life figures. And one of the reasons why were those nicknames. 25 years later, he's as identifiable as ESPN. My one-time baseball broadcast partner and former Dodger pitcher Jerry Rolls-Royce used to tell me, it's a game everybody can play. That's why they work. I can't thank you enough for those daily suggestions I get in the mail to this day and for those letters of protest that you wrote back in the mid-'80s. They brought me as close personally to our viewers as anything else that's happened to me here in 25 years. Thank you very much. Coming up, a tribute to a very special partner of mine since ESPN's inception. And we'll have the answer to who's the only team to make the playoffs every season in ESPN's existence. But first, the countdown of ESPN's greatest games continues, numbers 10 through 6. Overtime, Eastern Conference semifinals, the Flyers and Penguins were knotted at one. Primo cuts the inside, scores! There it is! Keith Primo wins this game in the fifth overtime. At halftime, the Lakers trailed the Mavericks by 28. Shot for the tie! Four, 
National League Divisional Series. The Marlins were ahead in games and ahead of the Giants by a run in the ninth. He's throwing home. Snow trying to score. The tag. A collision. He is out at home. And the Florida Marlins have cut down the Giants. Trailing 14 to 2 in the bottom of the seventh, the Indians began a comeback against the Mariners. Down the line. It's headed into the corner. They have tied the game. Unbelievable. They have come back from a 12 run deficit. And there it is. Base hit. Here comes the throw. Brief. And Cleveland has won it. I know I've got to go. I've, I've got to go, and I've got one last thing. I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. Cancer can take away all my physical abilities. It cannot touch my mind. It cannot touch my heart. And it cannot touch my soul. And those three things are going to carry on forever. I thank you, and God bless you all. Over 25 years, you endure a great deal of sadness. Just seeing that Jim Valvano speech at the first ESPYs a short time before he passed away is a chilling reminder. You've seen us lose some of our family here. Many you didn't know, some you did, like Pete Axtell, Dick Schapp, and Ralph Wiley. And then there was Tom Mees. You and I met Tommy in 1979, and it didn't take long to realize that he embodied the spirit of ESPN. Just give them the sports, because they love it, just like we do. That was Tommy, pure and simple. Never any airs. It's hard to believe he drowned eight years ago. Man, I told you one time, and that's freezing. You never gave me a cue. Hi, from Bristol, Connecticut. It's the ESPN first annual turkey draw. He had this absolute irrepressible enthusiasm for his job, for sports, for his friends. He uh, captured the essence of what was the success of this place. We love what we were doing. I cannot tell a lie. That's his name, Daniel Boone. He's the fellow we saw a few minutes ago throw a double to Gary Lavelle, so I don't know how much help he's going to be. Tommy's enthusiasm and the twinkle in his eye when we were just doing highlights where it was unmatched. Tommy was all about, let's show him the action. I'm excited about what I'm seeing, and I'm not trying to make a name for myself. He enjoyed being a reporter. He loved being on, on the anchor desk, but he really loved being at the games. His dream was to be a play-by-play -play announcer, and when that happened, um, he was absolutely thrilled. I used to describe him to people as the one person on the face of the earth who, when you asked him how he was doing, actually told you. You know, everybody else was like, how you doing? I'm great, fine, you too? Yeah, that's great. Not Tommy. Tommy, how you doing? Oh, geez, my car's broke down, my wife's mad at me, the kids are in trouble. Completely devoted to his girls. That was one of the main things that drove him. We're on the road and we're talking about uh, you know, Tommy, come on, we can, you know, spend a few extra bucks here. And he's, no, no, I'm, uh, I'm staying in. I'm getting ready for the game, and I'm going to make sure that I put as much money away for the girls. When I heard the news that he died, I, I you know, I didn't want to go to the funeral. And as soon as I walked in the door, there was a big poster of, of Tom. And uh, I, I never made it in. I think it's a, it's a wound that uh, still hasn't healed for, for all of us. You just saw inside his soul what a great person he was. He just had an ability to, to make you laugh, and then he made you cry. And that's probably what, what made him special. We all appreciated his approach, his dedication, and um, I think, though, the, the thing that you'll remember the most about him is his friendship. 
He's definitely part of this, there's no doubt about this. He'd have some candid observations about uh, the operation, and how we could be doing it better, and uh, more importantly for him, hey, what's the next game we're doing? He was the kind of man who led a full life in the time that he had. He had a goal, and he lived it, and he fulfilled it. He was very successful, but he was a regular person. It was a pleasure for all of us to work alongside Tommy Mees. And I can say forever that among all the things I've done here in 25 years, nothing will top working the overnight sports centers every night in those early years with Tom. Our love goes out to Michelle and their daughters, Lauren and Gabrielle. It always will. Tom was here when it all began. He'll always be connected to our birth. Later in the show, Another original will join me as we look back at the images of ESPN. question the game has evolved a great deal since I came into the league in 1979. It's bigger, better, and stronger. So much has changed, but the name of the game is trying to win the Stanley Cup. As an 18-year-old coming to professional hockey, to last year, 25 years later, when the puck dropped, it became automatic to go out there and, and give it everything you had. I started off as a banger, fighter. In my second or third year, I was playing left wing. And then I was moved to center playing behind Wayne. He started winning the Cups in Edmonton. Coming to New York, I basically had to start from scratch. I felt the best way to come into the dressing room and get the respect of the players was to earn it. To see it finally come true for so many fans is a tremendous emotional experience for me. Coming into the NHL as an 18-year-old was a dream come true. When the day comes to retire, I'll be able to walk away with my head held high and move on to another phase of my life. Mark Messier is the only athlete from the Big Four, NHL, NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, to have been an active player in his league all 25 years ESPN has existed. Ricky Henderson, Tim Raines, Jesse Orozco, almost. The only team to make the playoffs each of ESPN's years, the St. Louis Blues, who despite such consistency, have never won a Stanley Cup. Coming up, closing in on the end of 25 years, the memorable images of ESPN, and another special guest who traces back to the beginning. And closing in on our greatest game ever, as voted on ESPN.com, here's numbers five to two. Seconds left in the first overtime. Duke trailed North Carolina by eight. This is incredible, baby. This is awesome, baby. When it comes to the Lord, they got a chance. He lets it fly. Oh! So now they get another five minutes and a chance for a W. Wojciechowski. Oh, Carroll. Oh, double overtime. Heartbreak hotel for the Duke Kings. began on May 30th, 1982, and continues September 6th, 1995. This game is now in the books. And let it be said that number eight, Cal Ripken Jr., has reached the unreachable star. With less than a minute left, Duke trailed Maryland by 10. This would be the most improbable of comebacks. Are you 
kidding. Oh. Williams oh. down the lane. Battier wide open for oh. three. Dixon into the lane. Oh, Battier blocks it. It's the most remarkable wow. comeback I have ever seen. In our first half year of existence, we all witnessed the United States Olympic hockey team defeat the Soviets at Lake Placid, a memory etched in our minds forever. And on our air, all those great games. And you voted this one as our very best. In a game lasting almost five hours, Arkansas and Kentucky equaled the NCAA record for most overtime periods ever. Let's it go! 41-41 in Lexington. Fourth overtime period coming. Last chance. Touchdown. Quarterback draw. All alone and untouched. We'll play six. Now make it up as he goes. He got it! Though both teams endured seasons of struggle, they combined for the highest scoring game in history. Can you believe it? We are still not done. Birmingham touchdown. He lost it. And Arkansas comes away with the win in seven overtimes. Wow. That maybe higher scoring than Arkansas Kentucky basketball game. Look, we couldn't wrap things up without getting a helping hand from the other anchor who's been here for all 25 years, Bob Lee. Good to see you. Good to see you. You know what? We started here, we were 24. I'm going to scare you now. We've been here over half our lives. Whoa. It's, it's a bit of a scary Whoa. thought. But it's been a treat. You know, what's most amazing to me, and from time to time we have this chance to sit back and reflect on some of the things that everybody here, the 3,000 people who work at this network mm -hmm. have put together over the years, but it has grown beyond sports, grown just beyond television, to become part of the fabric of American society. And so often, as you well know, you know, people in this business say, well, thank you for having us uh, into your homes. But as you encounter people, be they people prominent or just fans of games, they say, you know, it's good to meet you again, good to see you again. And you know you haven't met this person before. And I think it's a tribute to what this network has come to mean to people and to the affinity they have for this place. Other networks have viewers, but we're very fortunate this network has fans. Well, they feel like they know us, Bob. I mean, they feel like they've known us all their lives. But as you point out, uh, we carry a little burden there. With that comes a responsibility and something I think we have to keep our eye on the ball about. Uh, mm -hmm. Meaning so much to so many people, being on the air so often, so many networks, so many entities out there all the time. It's, it's something uh, I think that all of us work to strive to, to keep up to each day. Well, those of us from 1979 and the early 80s, I mean, who were here, really, we, we were drivers in a car full of gas, right? But we yeah. didn't have a road map, perhaps latter 20th century Lewis's and Clark's. What we discovered was magic. Thanks to all of you out there, remember? George? Thanks, Lee, and welcome everyone to the ESPN Sports Center. From this very desk in the coming weeks and months, we'll be filling you in on the pulse of sporting activity, not only around the country, but around the world as well. If it takes an interview, we'll do it. If it takes play-by-play, -play, we'll do it. If it takes commentary, we'll do that too. You're a sports nut like I am. 
It'll be like having seven Sundays in every week. The networks will do about 1,200 hours in a year, and our potential is some 8,760. Our cameraman takes a picture at a football stadium. That picture is fed into our ESPN remote truck to an Earth transmitting station, up to the satellite, back down to an Earth receiving station, over a cable in your hometown, into your television set in your living room. That's the way we'll function from the ESPN Sports Center, and we'll be filling you in on further updates as the broadcast progresses. Amazing images, uh, amazing memories, amazing. We're very fortunate to be a part of it. Uh, you've just seen how much uh, we've grown this past quarter century, but deep down, uh, I think we'll always be that little engine that could. I mean, it's the only way we know how to do it, and we're, we're not going to change, I, I guarantee it. When I think back on this past quarter century, that sounds rather uh, deep, but I think of the words of a, a songwriter from my home state of New Jersey. Uh, Bruce once wrote, uh, someday we'll look back on this and it will all seem funny. Good. It's been fun, and it's easy for us to sit out here and do this, but it's the folks that you don't see for whom this network and this entire entity has become a consuming passion that gets them out of bed every day to come in and raise the bar and do it day after day, month after month, and obviously decade after decade. Well, we have 3,000 folks working here at ESPN, but on behalf of all of the men and women who have ever worked here at ESPN, we all thank you for an amazing 25 years. We're ready to do it some more. Yeah. Bob? Quarter century in the books. Hard to believe. Amazing. Keep on chugging. For Bob Lee, I'm Chris Berman. Good night.